Uh, so our main payload will be two FLIR boson cameras, each of which has a focal length of 13.8 millimeters, and they take images with a resolution of 320 by 256 pixels. They have a combined mass of uh, 68 grams, and they take up a volume in the CubeSat of 9.702 cubic centimeters. Uh, each camera has a 16 degree horizontal field of view and images the ground with a resolution of uh, 760 uh, meters. Uh, and according to ConOps, they will uh, image the ground simultaneously, both uh, the sea and the cloud tops, uh, once per every two days. We will be up, so as um, systems engineering mentioned, we're trying to show that uh, some of the technology and uh, missions conducted by the VIRS imaging satellite can be done on a CubeSat, uh, and as a result, we'll be imaging in the M14 and M16 long wave infrared bands, uh, which is exactly what the VIRS did. <coughs> uh, in order to image in these discrete bands, we're going to be using some long wave infrared narrow band pass filters, uh, so we will have a different filter for each camera since they have two uh, distinct missions. And the filters are germanium coated, um, and each one is obviously slightly different to allow certain wavelengths to be transmitted through the filter and reach the camera, and certain wavelengths to be reflected. Uh, here's an example graph that's not uh, of these two specific wavelengths, but it's uh, similar to the ones we will be using. Great. Now, the camera condition goes to being a uh, very, like, professional quality camera has a wide variety of settings that are not, um, since it's not an actually like space camera, it needs some experimentation done in space like environments that we could simulate hypothetically in the future, but due to our time of a week, uh, we are unable to simulate exactly. Um, and it also, so there's some um, hardware components of the camera and some software components that have to do with the calibration and um, other like, image settings and then discuss briefly that um, we need a lot of experimentation for but are very important to the camera and important to our scientific mission. First is the non-uniformity correction, which is basically how the camera deals with like bad pixels. Being such a high quality um, and specific camera is unfortunately like a trade-off that it also has a tendency to get bad pixels, but the camera developers like, knew about this, so they have very good ways of correcting for those pixels so that even though the camera is a little like touchy at times, it um, accounts for that. So the first way is um, flat field correction, which is, we talked about calibration, we have that calibration uh, deployable unit, but the camera actually needs two sources of um, heat to calibrate. The first needs to be a black body, um, which I'm sure you all know, but in this it uses um, the shutter as that, it has an internal shutter that when it needs to calibrate, it has, um, it closes the shutter and quickly um, reads the pixels, or like takes a picture of the shutter and um, sees which pixels are not uh, what it should be. It knows the temperature of the shutter because it has an internal like thermometer, um, like uh, thermal sensor, so it can calibrate for that. Uh, but the, however, an internal shutter in space in a camera not made for space is very worrying to us um, as it might break. If it breaks while our, we're trying to take photos and it's, or if it breaks in the closed position, then we have no photos except for of the shutter, which is not very helpful. Um, so what we ins we'll, uh, one way, we'll talk about that more in the risk management second, um, but that's just our concern. And the other thing that it has is um, silent shutterless um, non-uniformity correction, which is uh, basically some algorithms that can just, um, like based on the picture taken, based on past history, just um, like correct some of these non-uniformities without using the shutter. And then finally, we have uh, one more setting, which is the main state of the camera, which is basically the trade-off that it gives you between um, having a picture that can have a uh, very wide, um, like, image or a wide thermal sensor, like that can go from um, a very low degree um, or very low temperature to very high temperature in one scene. But fortunately, we lose out on some of the like detail there. Um, so that would be the low gain state, which um, is actually less good for illusion because obviously the Earth does not have a huge range of temperatures. The temperatures uh, are from about negative 50 Celsius to about 500 degrees Celsius, which the Earth luckily does not regularly go to. 
So instead, we could go to a high main state where it's a very sensitive seed, <coughs> but unfortunately, um, there's less of a range. And there's also some more like algorithm issues there that um, there has to be more settings changed with the camera, which is also a problem. Uh, as Isabel mentioned, the FLIR does two-step calibration, and this is our second step. Uh, we're going to use a tape measure deployable, uh, which will be equipped with a heater and a thermal couple, so that we have a body of known temperature besides the shutter, uh, and it will intersect uh, the both 16-degree fields of views um, very minimally, so that it can take up a couple of pixels on our array uh, to calibrate it. Um, and it will be deployed, um, I believe as structures mentioned, it will be folded uh, for launch, and then there will be a uh, fishing line or some sort of burned wire, which will be uh, belted by a 10 ohm resistor. Uh, some of the risks we determined were that uh, the deployable could fail to open uh, or pose on shutter failure. Um, so if we were unable to open the, the deployable, uh, we would be left with an inability to calibrate our images completely. Uh, but we would still be able to get raw data even if it didn't have a specific uh, temperature assigned to it. Um, and if the boson shutter fails, uh, we would essentially be left with the permanent inability to take images. The way we hope to uh, mitigate that is through rigorous testing of the deployable. Um, we thought it was uh, very improbable that it would fail in the first place, and we still think that it's uh, probably probably probable. Um, well, <laughs> like if they can fail, then we'll have to find out why it failed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the boson shutter failure. Uh, part of the con ops considerations were to uh, uh, how often we were going to take images was we didn't want to put uh, undue stress on the boson shutter by having it open and close um, excessively. So by taking uh, fewer images, we're hoping to mitigate the risk of it uh, suffering mechanical failure. We also talked a little bit about. Um, the other way you can reduce frequency is changing the settings so that it only calibrates when it's like absolutely necessary, which we discussed too. So that would help bring down the number of times the shutter actually closes, bring down the risk of it actually breaking. All right. So all of our flight software was developed in a modular manner using NASA's core flight executive system. Uh, up here, you can see the basic workflow that we're using to actually activate the payload and take a picture. So first, one of the Core Flight Executive apps, which is the scheduler app, will send a request over the Core Flight Executive bus to the payload app, which transmits a request to a separate Linux application, which actually activates the camera and takes a picture. Now, this Linux application will also handle the calibration of the camera using the deployable, uh, and it will also activate the shutter calibration, closing the shutter and calibrating the camera in that way. And furthermore, it'll decode the binary data that's actually returned to the camera. Uh, next, the camera data is transmitted back from the separate camera app to the Core Flight Executive app, where it's compressed and then transmitted again along the bus to the telemetry app, where it will be transmitted back to the ground station uh, at the next opportunity. So here you can see two examples of photos we decoded from the uh, uh, thermal cameras. This is a lepton image. The lepton is basically a lower, uh, lower resolution, lower end uh, thermal camera that we initially use for testing. And eventually, we moved on to using the boson, which provides a much more high resolution image.